Welcome tribe members and extended tribe to another episode of Conscious Leaders. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming Jenny Emery. Jenny is a senior people leader. She's author of Leading for Organizational Change, which is all about building purpose, motivation, and belonging, topics I'm very interested in. Um, she's also a speaker, a consultant, a coach, and has been featured in Financial Times, Top 100 Most Influential Women in Engineering in the UK and Europe. Wow, I feel very honored to have you, Jenny. Um, Jenny is well-versed in how to create culture, manage change, leadership, strategy development, and much more. I know we're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, so without further ado, Jenny, thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy day. Thank you. It's lovely to be here and talking to you. So let's just start with you. Can you give a summary of your background and your journey to where you are now? Sure. Um, it's a bit um, windy. So I began my career originally as a corporate lawyer. I studied law at university because um, that's what clever kids from working class Scotland who don't want to study medicine do. Um, and then came to London for an adventure and joined um, one of the, the big city law firms from called Linklaters and um, did my training contract and became a corporate lawyer and loved lots and lots of aspects of that, the intellectual challenge, the adrenaline, working in a big team, making things happen, and really didn't like the fact that I never got to see the end of the story. When you do a, a, a corporate transaction and you know, two firms are merging or you're creating a joint venture to do something new, as a lawyer, you're involved in the kind of structuring and making that happen, but then you never get to see what happens next. So when I was still um, a relatively junior lawyer, I took a bit of a shot in the dark and went to work for the then managing partner of um, my law firm who needed someone to be a kind of dog's body, bag carrier, speech writer, general assistant to him. Um, and that kind of role when you're young is so exciting and so instructive because you kind of have access on areas and you can be around board tables that you wouldn't otherwise be around and listening and learning how business really works. Um, so I did that and at the same time I did an MBA so that I had kind of theory and practice happening very much um, hand in hand. And when you're young like that and have no direct authority, people tell you the truth about all sorts of stuff. So the, yeah, I learned so much about what motivates people and how to build relationships and rapport with people. So much so that off, I, I came out of my MBA. I, I think I went into my MBA expecting it to make me a thing in the way that being a lawyer is a kind of identity um, that I might emerge as a finance person or a marketing person. And I actually just emerged as somebody who loves businesses and strategy in the broadest sense and the role of business in society and how they impact the communities they serve and thinking about how you make sense of that whole ecosystem. And I also emerged knowing that I was fascinated um, by what makes people tick and how you unlock the potential in one person or two people or a whole organization of people to make those cool corporate level things happen. So I did a master's in coaching fairly shortly after I did my MBA. And really since then, my career has been at the space where people and culture type roles meet business and strategy type roles. Um, and sometimes with one title and sometimes with the other. So yeah, for um, a long time, I was in professional services firms in corporate roles, helping with the running of law firms by and large. Um, and then for a while, I was the people director of a big law firm. And then I became the strategy director there. Um, which is around the time that you were alluding to where I also wrote a book about some of what was going on. We can perhaps dig into some of that shortly. Um, and then bringing it right up to date, I spent three years as the um, Chief People Officer of Arup, which is a global design and engineering firm just rethinking their whole approach to people and culture. And I'm now with Advent International, which is a private equity firm helping them think about the people and culture elements for themselves as a firm, but also across their whole portfolio of companies. I mean, you've got a very um, peppered past with lots of interesting roles. And I guess the thing I'd love to dive into is your that role that you took as you know, a young 
a young executive starting your career up the corporate ladder, you had access to so many leaders and you're saying, yeah. you know, they were honest with you, which a lot of the time it's, you don't get to hear that side. So I'd love to know some of the things that you learned about good leadership from being in that role and what you saw. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so the first thing I saw, I guess, because I was Tra you know, traveling extensively with this particular individual, this chief exec managing partner. Um, and it really, really has stayed with me and informed so much of what I do is how he never, ever tired of telling the story of what he was trying to do, right? To the point where I was like, he was a smart guy and his brain went at 100 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so he must have been bored of hearing himself say the same thing over and over again, but he understood the importance of the story and how much that made a difference to taking people on the journey with him. Um, and I, he he was the managing, but he oversaw an interesting period in a kind of law firm history where um, Link Nations at that time was really the first law firm to clearly articulate a strategy for the whole firm and therefore almost become a bit more corporate in that sense. Um, but he, in terms of his history with the firm, had joined the firm when it was very small and there were very few partners and had personally welcomed every partner into the firm. And so he kind of sat at this fulcrum where it mattered to him enormously that he wasn't just directing a corporate to do something. He was winning hearts and minds. So the effort that he put in and the storytelling in that context, that, that blew my mind. And when I see great leaders now and watch what they do, that passionate belief in what they're doing and the storytelling that goes with it is so often a really big feature. And um, so I learned that. But I also learned from the stuff that he wasn't as good at. And um, so perhaps it's a kind of it's almost in, is it inevitable. He was very good at telling stories and he was less good at listening. Um, so he would be in a room and his role would be to tell the story, but I could sit back and watch. So it meant that he, he, he would leave a room saying, well, that was a great meeting. And I could say, oh yeah, but nobody from, I don't know, the Paris office said anything. Like, do you want me to figure out why? And then that, you know, that's where not being a leader was actively helpful because you can go and have a different conversation with you know, people around the table who might not be as bought in um, by virtue of, of, of being in a different role. Um, so what did I learn? I learned about the, I guess, ultimately the importance of communication both ways, both telling a great story, but also really paying attention, not just listening, really absorbing and paying attention to the whole context that you're in. Yeah, sort of that active listening where you're even taking the cues from how they're, what the body language is. Yeah, and what the room feels like and where the energy feels high and where it drops, all of, all of those things. Yeah, I mean, really good things to learn at a young place in your career. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, can we talk about your book for a little bit? So Leading for Organizational Change, and can you give a little bit of background on that um, and how it came about? Yes, no, I would love to. So, you know, full disclosure first, I love writing. So writing is my thing. I would do it as often, you know, for as many hours as I, as I, as I have for as long as I can. And I think that's important because so many people do that kind of, you know, people are so sort of gobsmacked or impressed at people who write books. And that presumes that it's a hardship. And for me, it was a complete pleasure. So I just want to be kind of, I just want to own the fact that it was a fun adventure for me i'm on the flip side where i'm always i'm i don't love writing and i always get really critical of my writing so it takes so much more time so i'm pleased to hear that you enjoy it and that it's so sort think, of yeah, a passion it's important to know because if you think about how you put, make time for things in your day it's so much easier to make time for something you love so what really prompted the book was i was um I was the director of strategy for a law firm for cms and we were doing a series of mergers um in in overall terms not huge but in the you know the the legal sector the biggest merger in the, the city's history at, at that time so we made a small acquisition of a firm in scotland called dundas and wilson and then we merged cms with navarro and allswang to create a new firm and i led that that work i was part of the team that did the deal but then i was also responsible for ensuring that the firm was integrated and felt like one firm and that it worked and when I was doing that work, 
which I absolutely loved, I couldn't find a book to read <laughs> to help me do it. And I am, you know, much as I love writing, I also love reading. I'm the kind of person who spends a hundred quid on Amazon before I take one practical step towards doing anything. And there wasn't a book, there were really dry books on M&A about, you know, balance sheets and value leakage. And then there were self-help books by Brenny Brown and others about how to manage change in your personal life. And I was just kind of triangulating wildly and trying to kind of sense make and, and have a theory. So what I ended up doing was writing the book that I wished I had been able to read. Um, and I, I do think this is important to say, I wanted to write it as, at that point, an under 40 woman with an under 40 woman's voice and frame of reference. Um, because so few books, still so few business books are written by women. Um, and so many of the ones that are, are explicitly about being a woman in business. And that wasn't what I wanted to write. I just wanted to write a book about business that instead of having folksy anecdotes about baseball, had folksy anecdotes about dragging my children to the dentist and you know sitting outside ballet classes and the stuff that was my lived experience because I really felt strongly that, and I do feel strongly that having a diversity of voices in the business literature canon is really important. Um, this has been such a lovely conversation. I really appreciate you taking your time out. We obviously had a little bit of a delay with technology, but we managed to figure I'm it so out. I'm so sorry about that, but um, yeah. Not at you. all. Um, if people wanted to find you, find out more about you, learn more about your book, how can they find you? Ah, they can find me on LinkedIn. They can also find me on jenemery.com. So jenemery, all one word, dot com, where I blog sporadically <laughs> not often enough but um links to the book um both the book we talked about and I'll, i also have a random side hustle in poetry and that is all there wonderful well we'll put that all into the notes so people can access it directly yeah. um i really appreciate your time your openness your honesty um even a bit of vulnerability thank you very it's been much such a treat thank you so much for asking me what, an, what a privilege to talk about myself for a bit <laughs> kind but definitely not weak thank you very much jenny oh, emery thank you so much <laughs> take care bye-bye until next time everyone be here and be well